Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. Thank you for the faithfulness of your children coming week after week to study your word. Thank you for the interest you've given us. We pray that our coming will not be in vain in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that your spirit will open our understanding so that as we read these verses of scripture and we search comparing scripture with scripture and endeavoring to understand what you have for us, we pray, Lord, your purpose of bringing us to the Bible study will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that you make us matured people that know the reason for doing what we do so that the Bible study will be of the greatest benefit to every one of us. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. We come to our Bible study tonight once again with the joy of knowing that the Lord loving us has preserved his word and his truth for us. And it's a joy to recognize those who are coming for the first time. And if this is your first time, I want to encourage you that you keep on coming. And then for those of us who have been coming, let's be doers of the word. Because it's not only the hearers that are blessed, but those who practice, obey, and do the will of God. We're in a series of Bible studies, and we're in Second Peter at this time. We started obviously from chapter 1, and we've gone from verse to verse. And now we're in chapter 3 of Second Peter. Today we're looking at two verses of scripture. It's in verse 10 and verse 11 of Second Peter chapter 3. Open your Bible with me. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Peter the Apostle, inspired by the Spirit of God, had been talking on the second coming of the Lord. And he had approached him from various angles. Number one, he wanted to show the certainty of the coming of the Lord. Number two, he wanted to tell the believers that all the scoffers and the doubters and the unbelievers that were coming to them and making them to doubt the watch of the Lord and the sure prophecy that Christ will come back again. The Apostle Peter wanted them to know that these are just deceivers. And of course they should not even be surprised because the word of God had said in prophetic utterance that the false prophets and the false Christ and the false teachers and the scoffers and the doubters will come. And these will be doubting the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The very fact that these people had appeared showed that the prophecy of the word of God is right on target, is right on line. And then he was now telling them the arguments of the people. Because the scoffers were saying, after all, where is the promise of his coming? Because since the fathers fell asleep, all things have been as they were. And the apostle Peter wanted them to understand that these people were willingly ignorant. That is, they didn't consider that the power of God that made the world to be. That same power of God can make the world to come to go out of existence. Not only that, that the Lord God Almighty had suspended the powers of nature, the laws of nature, and the laws of gravity a lot of times because the law that the Creator made cannot be greater than the Creator Himself. Now He continues to show the people that the day of the Lord will eventually, will actually come. Now you see in the passage I've read to you in verse 10, it says, but the day of the Lord will come. When it says the day of the Lord, why in particular the day of the Lord? Please understand, it's not talking about a 24-hour day, morning, afternoon, evening, and night. It's talking about a prophetic day. Therefore, it's talking about a period of time when God Almighty will take all things to himself. Actually, this time in which we are living now, no matter how many years, is man's time of probation. This is man's day. We use that language uh, even with ourselves when we are talking and somebody is trying to do something funny and you're still quiet and folding your hand. I say, that's your time. This is your day. Do whatever you want now. But please understand, my day is coming. 
and sometimes the teachers will use uh, that language of their students they will say now students huh, well my day is coming and that day if you don't pay attention now if you don't study now if you if you don't do what i'm telling you now my day is coming and when he says my day is coming he means the whole period of that exam when the teacher will be the one that sets everything and it will be the final authority to decide what what happens to that student god's day of retribution is coming here is man's day of rejection and rebellion the, the time when man feels i am and nobody can unseat me i will do what i want there is no god there is no lord there is no creator anywhere leave me alone to do what i want here is man's day but at the end of man's day when everybody will come under judgment then will be the lord's day of retribution now during man's day of freedom man makes himself lord without submission to the will of his creator the day of the lord will come when the Lord will be Lord indeed. And then he will reward every man according to his deeds. That's why it says here, but the day of the Lord will come. And Jesus is telling us there is a definiteness about it. And, and there is an assurance about it. This term used in scripture is Christ when Jesus Christ will come back. And he will bring flaming fury and the anger of God upon all the sinners of the world. It's a future time. It's an eschatological day of devastation and doom and damnation. It's the day of God's vengeance. The day of the Lord has a definite future and final fulfillment in prophecy. Its fulfillment will affect the sky and the sun and the moon and will affect the stars and will affect what we see as the heavens, the galaxies and the whole earth. That coming day of the Lord will be the day of judgment of perdition of ungodly men. The day of the Lord is associated with final judgment of the ungodly in the whole world and when it comes who shall be counted worthy to escape the judgment and the wrath of god as we study this prophetic day what you should be thinking about should the day come and the devastation and the doom uh, it comes the destruction comes upon the world who will escape that's why paul the apostle is asking the question in hebrews look at your bible hebrews chapter 2 in Hebrews chapter 2, in verse 3, he's telling us, he's asking a question, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? That is, after we have heard in this time of man's opportunity and man's period of having life and death set before you, blessing and causing set before you, salvation set before you, if you reject, if you neglect, how shall we escape? The judgment and the damnation and the doom and the devastation of that day of the Lord, if we neglect so great salvation, which are the false, began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. In Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 6 in verse 17, let me back up to verse 15, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and we shall be able to stand and that's the reason why as we come today and we're looking at readiness for the great day of the lord we want to prepare ourselves so that whenever the day will come then we'll be found ready because we have not neglected the salvation of the Lord, and the provision of his grace for our lives. There are three points we're going to consider in the message today. Number one, prophecies concerning the day of the Lord. Prophecies concerning the day of the Lord. Number two, perplexities connected with the day of the Lord. There are some perplexities, pain, devastation connected with that day of the Lord. Number three, preparing for the coming day of the Lord. Preparing. For the coming day of the Lord. Number one, prophecies concerning 
the day of the Lord. Hey, look at this in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And let's stop there for a moment. It's talking about this day. And it's telling us of the assurance uh, that this day of the Lord will definitely come. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. This day of the Lord is the time when the Lord Jesus Christ will be manifested as the judge of all the earth with all power and with authority. It is called this day because he will then be the central, grand and prominent actor as the judge of all. It says the day of the Lord will come. The Lord came the first time to save sinners and to bring them into the kingdom of God. Repent ye for the kingdom of God is at hand. But it's coming the second time. And at that time when he comes, he'll not be presenting salvation. He'll not be preaching the gospel. He'll not be showing mercy. He'll not be healing the sick. He'll not be casting out devils. He will be judging sinners who have rejected the love of God and they have refused to be saved. As you think about the second coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ is prophesied in scripture. Of the 333 prophecies concerning Christ, 109 were fulfilled at his first coming. Remaining 224 prophecies to be fulfilled at his second coming. As we look at the Old Testament passages all together, there are over 1,500 Old Testament passages referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Obviously, such a subject must be very important if that single subject, the coming of Christ, the second time, is referred to 1,500 times in the Old Testament alone. And when you think about the New Testament, one out of 25 verses in the New Testament refers to the second coming of Christ. And Jesus Christ himself talking to his own disciples and giving those parables and saying a lot of things, he referred to his own second coming 21 times. And over 50 times, we are told in the New Testament, be ready, be ready, be ready, more than 50 times. That means the end is a very definite thing. Christ is coming again. Christ's second coming is a major theme in the watch of God. In the book of Revelation alone, the second coming is announced from the very beginning of that revelation until the end of the book of Revelation. Please follow me. Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 1, looking at verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of there shall wail, shall cry, shall weep, shall lament because of him, even so, amen. And then in chapter 2, verse 25, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. It says there's no doubt about it, I'm coming. And the counsel I have for you, the commandment I have for you, the injunction I have for you is that you hold fast that thing which you have until I come. In chapter 3 and in verse 11, it says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. If there were no danger of losing the crown, if there were no danger of missing out when you will come, if it's eternal security, you are saved and saved forever. Once you are saved, you are forever saved. Whatever you do, wherever you go, whatever you drink, whatever you smoke, you are forever saved. There will be no warning. But because there is a possibility of losing your crown, there is a possibility of losing what you've got. That's why it says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. And then you come to chapter 16 and in verse 15. Chapter 16, verse 15 of Revelation. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and this is shame. It says, Behold, I'm coming. It says it over and over and over again. And it says, I'm coming, I'm coming. When he comes to the last chapter of Revelation, the last chapter of the New Testament, the last chapter of the whole Bible, he repeats it over and over and over. And he says, I am coming. Get ready. I am coming. Be prepared. I am coming. You ought to watch. 
In Revelation chapter 22, reading verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the saints of the prophecy of this book. And then you come to verse 12. It says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. And then before he rounds up everything, Joseph, verse to the end, it says in verse 20, He will testify these things, surely, certainly, without a shadow of doubt, I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The Lord is coming again. I said the Lord is coming again. In 2 Peter, come on to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come. It, it sounded as something that is certain, as something that is sure. Will come. And then he put something here as a thief in the night. What does that mean? As a thief in the night. Number one, suddenly he will come. When thieves come in the night, they come suddenly. And so when the Lord comes, he will come suddenly. And there will be no time to prepare. Number two, he'll come without previous warning. Without previous warning, the Lord will come. That's why it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night without any previous warning. In fact, Jesus said that over and over. He said, It will be as the days of Noah, when they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the flood came and took them unawares. And they were not prepared because for them there was no previous warning. Number three, unannounced. There will be no announcement over the loudspeaker, over the radio, over the television, in the newspapers. Jesus is coming at such a time. He says, as concerning that day, nobody knows, not the angels of heaven, not even himself, but my Father only. It will be unannounced, number four. Now, it says, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In the night when the thieves come. There is much darkness and little light. What? Look around you. Look around you. As you look at the spiritual condition of the world in which we live, there is much darkness and little light. And Jesus said it's at such a time when darkness is all over, when false doctrine is all over, when wickedness is all over, when evil is all over, that the Lord will come. Number five. When the thieves come, the majority of people in the community are asleep. Only the minority are awake. And the Lord is saying, the day of the Lord will come. As a thief in the night, the majority of people will be asleep spiritually. They'll be, they'll be lukewarm. And a lot of many will wax cold. It is at that time when the majority of people are asleep and only the minority are at alert and they are watching and they are praying and they are awake. That's when the Lord will come. Number six, when the thieves come, they don't take everything in the house. The thieves come and they take what seems precious unto them. And what looks worthless to them, redundant to them, or needed, they leave behind. And then they just come quickly and they take away the precious. And then they go and leave the worthless behind. When Jesus comes, he'll be taking away only the people that are precious to him. The glorious church, without spot, without wrinkle, holy and without blemish. He will take away only the precious and leave the worthless behind. Number seven, when the thieves come, and after the thieves have gone, those who are asleep, they wake up in shock. After the thief is gone. And Jesus is saying that he will come. In fact, he tells us in Revelation, I read it to you already. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. As a thief in the night. What does he mean by that? He says, I come. I take my people away. And the people of the world will not know. After he is gone, they wake up in shock. Something has happened. So and so is gone. So and so is gone. So and so is gone. The Lord is saying then, I'll come as a thief in the night, my day. The day of the Lord will come suddenly as a thief in the night. And it comes as a shock to the people of the world that are not prepared. That's the reason we're studying all these scriptures so that we ourselves will get prepared. We're talking about the scriptures. Now the prophecies concerning the day of the Lord. Uh, the prophecies concerning the day of the Lord. In Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, reading there from verse 39 and verse 40. Luke chapter 12, verse 39. Here he tells us, and this know, that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched. 
and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. You see the comparison the Lord Jesus Christ is making. He said, when the thieves come, the good man of the house, the landlord of the, the inhabitants of that house, the tenants, they will not know because if they had known, they would have prepared. And it says, I'm coming in such a way. Be ye also therefore ready and be prepared because the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, will come at a time at an hour that ye think not. In First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. It's still telling us about the suddenness of the coming of the Lord. It will not be announced. If we're going to get ready, here is the time of opportunity for us to get ready. It tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. It will be sudden. It will be unannounced. It will not be at a time people are expecting. It will be at a time when the majority of people are asleep spiritually. It will be at a time when Jesus Christ will come suddenly and it will take the precious thing of the earth away. And then the people that are in the world, left in the world, they wake up in shock because the Lord has come and has taken his own away and then devastation will come. When the thieves come, and day after they have gone and the people wake up in shock, they begin to count their sorrow and their pain and their loss. And after Christ has come and he has taken the people of God, the precious of the earth, he has taken them away. Then the people wake up in shock, the devastation, the pain, the doom coming upon them. The wrath of the Lord Almighty because the day of judgment and the day, that's the period, uh, the period of judgment and of wrath for God has come upon them. In verse 3 it says, for when they shall see peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them has travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape because they are not born again they shall not escape but ye brethren are not in darkness and not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a seed in matthew chapter 24 matthew chapter 24 Reading from verse 27, prophecies concerning the day of the Lord. 24, 27, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. When a thief comes in the night, he doesn't come to entertain himself or to eat in the you know at the dining there he just comes suddenly and then he takes what he wants to take and then he's gone jesus christ is saying when he comes he'll come suddenly and it will be as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west so shall also the coming of the son of man be first corinthians chapter four in first corinthians chapter four here in verse five uh, still talking about this coming of the lord and how we need to get ourselves prepared therefore judge nothing before the time until the lord come he's coming he says you can suspend all judgment and you can suspend all evaluation you can suspend all examination of all the other other person's life the other person's activity the other person's ministry and the other person's marriage and the other person's uh, family suspend all that because what's important for you now is to watch and then take care of yourself because the lord is coming and when the lord comes it will not matter whether you have judged brother a or sister b or whoever what will matter is whether you are ready or you are not ready therefore he says therefore judge nothing before the time until the lord come who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart and then shall every man have praise of god it will be at that time we'll know the people that are precious of the lord because he comes and he takes the precious saints away and then the other people that are left behind only then shall we know who is a true believer who is a true follower of god and who has been a hypocrite all the time hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 telling us that the day of the lord is approaching the day is coming and you better get yourself prepared hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is but 
exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching as you see the day approaching as you see the day approaching as you look at all the prophecies concerning the coming of the lord and the things surrounding the coming of the lord the pestilence and the famine and the wars and the rumors of wars and the false prophets and the false cries and everything that jesus spoke about that will precede just is coming and you see all those things around you then you can tell that the day is approaching and then in verse 37 for yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry he will come in second thessalonians chapter 2 reading from verse 1 in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, his coming, and by our gathering together unto him. When he comes, then the precious people of the earth, the saints of God, those who are saved, those who are sanctified, those who are made holy, those who are living righteously, they'll be gathered unto him, that in verse 2, that ye be not so shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there shall come, except there come a falling away first. You understand? He's saying that before that day comes, there'll be a falling away first. And when you think about the time in which you are living, understand, these verses of scripture we are reading now, they have been written about 2,000 years ago. And then the Paul, the apostle, inspired by the Spirit of God says, there will be a falling away force. And I cannot begin to tell you today how many, many churches are falling away and falling away and falling away. Those who are standing by the truth of scripture before on salvation, on sanctification, on holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, on all the major doctrines of the Bible. And now as a whole denomination, they're falling away from that truth. And then it says, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he as God seated in the temple of God showing himself that he is God remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time for the mis mystery of iniquity doth already work the mystery of iniquity that is iniquity as a, as a hidden thing, as a mystery. That is just shooting out and coming out like smoke, like a volcano out of the whole of the earth. It says that mystery of iniquity is now at work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Because the church is still here. That's why the mystery of iniquity has not totally encircled the whole globe. And taking the whole globe and people become intoxicated with madness and with evil and with wickedness. Because of the church that is still here. The light is still shining. And we're the salt of the earth. And we're retarding the corruption of the earth. That's what it says. The mystery of iniquity is working already. But only he that now letteth hindering it will continue to hinder until it be taken out of the way after the rapture. Then after that rapture shall the wicked be revealed. That's the Antichrist. Who the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his countenance. Even him who's coming is after the walking of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved and for this cause for this reason God shall send them some delusion that they should believe a lie that is there are people the truth comes to them but they made up their minds and they say yes i see those verses yes i see the scriptures yes i see the truth but i've made up my mind what i'm going to believe and i've sealed it up i've said thus far no more any truth that comes to me now i don't want to accept i've sealed up my mind I've made up my mind what to believe and what not to believe it says because of that god shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness come back to chapter one of that same book second thessalonians chapter one from verse seven and to you who are troubled 
to you who are persecuted, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction, separation from God, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come, when he shall come, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So then we know that the Lord is coming. Let's go back to Second Peter Second Peter chapter 3, we're talking about the day of the Lord. Second Peter chapter 3, we're not looking at verse 10. For the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That's, we've traced the prophecies, some of the prophecies relating uh, to the second coming, to the day of the Lord. Now we're going to look at the perplexities connected with the day of the Lord. Here is point number two. It says, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and also the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Here you're talking about the pain, the perplexity, the loss associated with the coming day of the Lord. And it's almost indescribable. Man has his day of anger against God. Now that's your day, man. But you see, the Lord also, he has his own day of anger and wrath coming. Man has today his day of rejecting the Lord. But man... Understand, God also has a Sunday of retribution when he will examine the works of man, the attitude of man to the grace and to the mercy and to the love that he brought. And those who have rejected, all of them then will face the day, the coming day of the Lord. On that day, the heaven shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, the whole earth, and the works that are therein. When you think of the works that are therein, he's talking about all the buildings there, all the industries there, all the things attractive to man there, all the things that man has labored for, to build up and to construct. Everything will be melted away in fervent heat and shall be burnt up. And what a day that will be. When you think about it, that all the labor of man today, and he refuses to think about salvation. And he refuses to think about eternal life. And he refuses to think about that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And he's laboring and laboring and laboring. And he wakes up early in the morning. He will not even have quiet time. He wakes up early in the morning. There is no time of fellowship with members of his family. He wakes up early in the morning. There is no time to prepare members of his family for eternity. And then he rushes to, to the trade or to the market or to the office. And then he's building up something in the world here. He goes here, he goes there, he runs about and he's trying to gather some dust and some mud and some cement and some sand and some stones together to raise up this. And then he points to this and says, that's what my hand has made. He points to that and says, that's what my hands have made. And then the Lord is telling us the day is coming. And it will be very, very soon when all those that do not know the Lord, of course, even those who know the Lord, those who know the Lord, the people of God, Everything that our hands have made, you will leave everything here. Because my brother, my sister, when the rapture takes place, you're not going to take that big house with you. When the rapture takes place, you're not going to take that certificate with you. They don't need it up there. When the rapture takes place, all those boxes and boxes and boxes and piles of clothes, you're not going to take them away. When the rapture takes place, all the money you stack in the bank, you're not going to take that away. When the rapture comes, the only thing you'll be able to take away, if you're born again, the salvation of the Lord. If you're born again, the holiness of the Lord. If you're born again, that sanctification experience the Lord has given you. If you're born again and you're living a holy and a righteous life, your life in Christ. That's all you'll be able to take away. If you're born again and you're living for the Lord and you're working for God, the testimonial of the Lord in your conscience, the testimony in your heart that I've served the Lord and you can count every day. This day I serve the Lord every day of the week with all sincerity and with all my heart. My motives are pure. My, the love is there. I put all my life and everything in the gospel. When the rapture takes place, 
that's the only thing you'll be able to take away. All the things you are building up, all the things you are racing up, all the things that will, you know, I don't have enough time, I don't have enough time. Even if you make the rapture, even if you make the rapture, you will leave everything behind. And when the day of the Lord comes, and everything goes up in fire, everything you have raised up, everything will be burnt to ashes. And then think about the people that are not even saved. They are not even born again. They are not even children of God. I don't have time to study the Bible. I don't have time to attend any Christian meeting. I don't have time to, uh, to listen to the message of salvation. I'm building something. Go ahead, my friend. Go and build the something you want to build. When the day of the Lord comes, and then the fire, it will come from beneath. It will come from beneath. It will come from above. Scientists tell us, if you know about you know, scientists and those astronomers and those geologists, go and ask them, they will tell you that the very center of the earth, you see, all this ground we're, look, we're staying on now, as we look at the globe, it's a thin shell. And then inside, there is a ball of liquid fire that is there. When the Lord made the earth, he made the earth in such a way that the liquid fire is inside the globe, it's inside the earth. And anytime you hear there is volcano, it's like an eruption in a little hole. It's like when you put a little pin on a particular globe, and then a little smoke, a little fire comes out. That's when you hear there's a volcano somewhere there's earthquake somewhere but then at that time the fire inside the globe it will puncture all the various parts of the globe and the flames will come and then the sun will it will be it will be like a heat of a million suns and then everything will be in fire and everything will melt away in fervent heat and then all the things will have amassed all the money in the bank all the clothes in the boxes all the houses you have built, all the things you have constructed, everything will be totally gone. And then you put your hand in the mouth like this, in one minute, what you labored for for 50 years, for 60 years, for 70 years, everything is gone in flames. And then your soul is not prepared to meet the Lord. You lost everything here. You lose everything over there. And you go empty-handed, a sinner, a, a deceiver, a rejecter, a, re, a rebel before the Lord. And you come before him and he says, what have you got to say? I called you to salvation. Here is my son, Jesus Christ. He came to the earth, he bore your sin. And he bore everything for you. And he just said, come, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's all he said. He said, my yoke is easy and my body is light. What was your attitude? What was your response? What were you doing? You were building this and building that and going here and going there and amassing this and amassing that and getting money and getting this and chieftain seat title and everything. Where are those things? They are burnt in fire. As your property is burnt in fire, then you yourself, you go to the everlasting fire. Where is the gain? That's why the Lord is telling us, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the righteous man is thought. And let him return unto the Lord. He will abundantly pardon if you come today because he's calling you today. At that day of the Lord, there will be perplexity, there will be pain, and there will be terrible loss. Because it tells us that all the elements, all the elements... Uh, of man's sphere, of man's space, the atmosphere, everything will melt away in fervent heat. And scientists will tell you that everything, everything, uh, the composition of the earth, when they talk about the elements, they're talking about the various elements that make the fire and the air and the earth and the water. And the scientists have analyzed that all the things that make up all those various things, that they are combustible, inflammable, that once the fire of the Lord comes in the devastation, all the things that you see today, and they are made up of these various elements, everything will burn away because that's the way those things are made even the works that are there in all of man's works and the developments and the inventions on which man has concentrated all his efforts and all his time and which has taken man's heart away from god all these works and things thereby therein shall be burnt up my question to you my brother my sister is where will you be where will you be and what will you have left when everything that you have labored for has been burnt in fire? And let's see this perplexity is connected with the coming of the coming day of the Lord. In Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. I'm reading to you there from verse 25. Luke 21, verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. 
and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexed city, with perplexed city, the sea and the waves running, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking at those seas which are coming on the earth. Here are the words of Jesus Christ. For the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man come in a cloud with power and great glory. You see the perplexity that will come in Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13. From verse 6 all through to verse 11. Isaiah 13 verse 6. How ye. For the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all the hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid, pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in, in pain as a woman that travelleth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold the day of the Lord. Behold the day of the Lord. Behold the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate and it shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it for the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light the sun shall be darkened in its going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine and i will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity and i will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Uh, please understand, Isaiah, who prophesied this, this same Isaiah prophesied that a virgin shall conceive. And who would have believed him? And really, a virgin later conceived. And this is the Isaiah that prophesied about Jesus Christ, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Who would have believed that this Christ that had been prophesied by Isaiah in chapter 35, it will heal the sick, and the lame will rise up and walk, it will open the eyes of the blind. Who will believe that that same Christ that opens the eyes of the blind and makes the lame to walk, in chapter 53, he'll be a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and then they will crucify him, and they'll they number him with the transgressors. He prophesied all these he prophesied about the spirit of god coming upon the messiah and then he said that when the spirit of god comes upon him he will be anointed to preach the gospel and to comfort the afflicted and to heal the sick and to heal the brokenhearted and jesus christ fulfilled all that well if he prophesied about christ on all those areas and those things were fulfilled I about this that he prophesied about the coming day of the lord and that it will be a day of doom and devastation and destruction. It will be a terrible scene for the people of the world. It's going to be so. That's the reason why you need to take note. And that's the reason why you need to prepare yourself so that that day will not come upon you by surprise. In Ezekiel chapter 30 from verse 1. Ezekiel chapter 30 from verse 1 the watch of the Lord came again unto me saying son of man prophesy and say thus says the Lord God how ye what was the day what was the day for the day is near even the day of the Lord is near a, a cloudy day it shall be the time of the heathen that is the time when the heathen those who have rejected the Lord it will be their time when judgment and wrath will come upon them in Sephaniah Sephaniah chapter 1 verses 14 and 15, Sephaniah 1, chapter 1, verse 13, verse 14, rather, the great day of the Lord is near. It is near, and he stares greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry, shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And you see what the Lord is telling us over and over about this coming day of the Lord, the day of judgment in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29 and verse 30. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, 
and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. These are the very words of Jesus Christ himself. And if you know that Jesus Christ is truth personified, he cannot tell a lie. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. He tells us that that day will be a day when the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Well, why, why will they mourn? Because there's not coming with mercy now. It's not coming with a salvation now. It's not coming with love now. It's coming as a terrible judge. And even it's Luke and the entourage and all the clouds and all the angels and the things surrounding him and the sun and the moon having taken part in that devastation and the heat scorching men and uh, causing a kind of heat that people will prefer to die. They'll, they'll mourn. We've lost a day of privilege, a day of opportunity a day when we could have received salvation but we did not and our mercy is gone and judgment has come in acts of the apostles chapter 2 acts of the apostles chapter 2 this coming day of the lord acts chapter 2 reading from verse 19 to verse 20 19 and 20 and i will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible notable day of the lord come everybody is telling us old testament new testament the day of the lord is coming the day of the lord is coming and it will be a day of devastation a day of judgment a day when christ rejects us and those who have rejected salvation and the love of god when they will suffer and then there'll be there'll be no repentance no opportunity for them again to be able to have the salvation of the lord in jude verse 14 15 and verse 16 jude from verse 14 and enoch also Enoch also, the servant from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly upon among them or among among them of all the ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. In verse 16, these are murmurers. Those who Partake in that judgment. Complainers. Those all complain, complain, complain. Walking after their own laws and their, their mouths. Speaketh great swelling words. Having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. All those people that are not able to take their stand. And because of big man or because of sugar daddy, sugar mommy. Uh, they are not able to really take their stand because of the respect they have for men. The respect they have for women is more than the honor, the loyalty, the faithfulness they can have for God. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, reading from verse 14. And the heavens shall depart as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island shall be moved out of their place. It's at that time the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man will hide themselves in the dens of the rocks and the mountains. And then it says, and they will say, unto the rock, unto the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day. And the, and the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? That's the reason why Jesus Christ uh, counseled all those who listen to him at his own time. And those who are listening to him today. How we ought to be prepared so that we'll be able to escape that devastation and judgment that is coming upon the world today. In Luke chapter 21 verse 34. Luke chapter 21 from verse 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with sufficient and drunkenness and the cares of this life. So that day, the day we are talking about, the day of the Lord, that day come upon you unawares, unprepared, not ready. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. 
And it's, it's not just talking about Nigeria or Ghana or West Africa or East Africa or the whole of Africa or Asia. It's talking about the whole world. It says as a snare, it will come upon them by surprise. They just wake up to the shock. That Christ had come. He's taking his people away. And now he comes again with devastating judgment. Today they are busy with, you know, this one and that one and that one and that one. No time for religion now. No time for uh, calling upon the Lord now. What are you talking about? I need to build this. I need to do this. I need to get this done. I need to get that done. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore. And pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all the sin that shall come uh, to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I pray we will escape this devastating day of the Lord in Jesus' name. Now, we need to prepare them. We need to prepare. In Second Peter chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 3, preparation. Now, preparing for the coming day of the Lord. Preparing for the coming day of the Lord. We're reading verse 11, but I'm going to start from verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Seeing then that all the elements and the heavens and the earth and the works that are therein, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. Seeing that all these certificates will be burnt up. Seeing that all these chieftaincy titles will be burnt up. Seeing that all these houses will be destroyed and, and demolished. Seeing that all these things we are amassing and gathering together. Seeing that all the things we are holding on to ourselves. I cannot serve the Lord now. I cannot serve the Lord now. My colleagues have built a house. I must build a house. My colleagues are riding cars. I must ride a car. My colleagues are doing this and I must do it. My colleagues, uh, you know, we, we came out of school together at the same time. Here is what they are doing. I must do it myself. Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Knowing that all the things that men are laboring and suffering for today shall eventually be burnt up. The wisest thing to do is to labor to possess eternal life, everlasting life, which cannot be dissolved, which cannot be burnt up. Even if it were possible for you to gain the whole world and all the things which the heart of man desires today, what will be the ultimate gain for you when all shall be lost, forever lost, in the fire? of the earth's judgment. That's why the apostle is saying by the Spirit of God, what manner of persons ought ye to be? As you meditate every day, and you hold the things of this world with a loose hand, and you don't quarrel with anybody, they want to take that thing, you're not going to court, you're not fighting, you're not struggling. You, you don't want to lose your soul because of all these things. After all, they're going to be dissolved. What are, what are we fighting about? What are we going to court about? What are we throwing stones about to any other person? What are we arguing about? What is it we're getting angry about? And we're losing our salvation? And we're losing our holiness? And we're losing our humility? And we're losing our loyalty? And we're losing our faithfulness to God? And we're losing commitment to the word of God? What are we fighting about? What are we looking for with all these neighbors? They don't have anything to lose because they don't have salvation. All they have is the mud and the dust and the sand and the stone they are gathering up. All they have is a parcel of land. And a parcel of land they are even fighting about. It's not enough to even bury them. All these things, they are the things that will vanish away. They don't have eternal life. And if we fight with them, if we quarrel with them, if we go to court with them, if we begin to exchange abusive language with them, we are the people that will lose our soul. They themselves, they are already lost. And they are in the cage of the devil. What are we fighting about with the unbelievers? If they want to struggle about anything, why don't you remember? After all, even if I get this, if we go to court and I get this thing from them, eventually all these things that we are gaining and getting will be burnt up and melted away in the fire. See then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought she to be in all holy conversation and godliness? The very fact that all that we see on earth, all the things acquired properly or fraudulently will be dissolved and destroyed ought to make us exert 
a, a, a kind of deep lasting influence on ourselves and shall lead us to seek and to maintain that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord because there is nothing abiding, there is nothing of lasting value on earth. Nothing of abiding lasting value on earth. Our real interest should be on holy living and godliness. Let me ask you, should the earth right now be totally dissolved? And should the houses be totally burnt up? Should the boxes be totally burnt up? Should the certificates all be burnt up? Should the things of earth all be burnt up? Should fire just got all, got all, the, all the banks? And then all the money you stack there, everything is gone? What will you have left? Will you still have the peace of God in your heart? That salvation that nobody can take away. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. And my father and I were greater than all. And no man can pluck them out of my hand. Well, that salvation that fire cannot take away, that salvation that the world cannot take away, will that salvation still be there when all the world is gone, when all the money is gone, when all the property of the earth is gone? What will you have left? That's the question we're asking you. And if you don't come to study the word of God, if you don't pray, if you don't have this eternal, heavenly, spiritual heritage, what do you have? What are you rejoicing about? I bought days, I've got days. Look at the amount of money I have in the bank. In a few minutes, I'm telling you, when the day of the Lord shall appear, when that day shall come, everything will be burnt up. What else will you have? Then you'll be like that foolish man that said, I've got quite a lot. Rejoice my soul. And then I don't even have where to lay them because there are so many and they are expanding. And then the Lord says, tonight your soul will be taken away from you. Who shall all these things be that you have gathered up? And so is every man that is uh, having riches here yeah, and is not rich towards God in heaven. That's why you need to be wise that when everything will go up and burst into flames, then you'll still have something that fire cannot burn. What does that take as we we'll prepare to meet the Lord when he comes? In First John chapter 3, First John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see mercy is. And then it says, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. Every man that has this hope in him, those who believe the scriptures, those who believe that after all, work or no work, job or no job, hunger or no hunger, one day hunger will last, on, hunger will finish. One day, all this pain, all this no job, no this, no that, everything will end. And then, like Lazarus, we'll be able to go to the Lord and we'll be in Abraham's bosom. But the rich man, with all that he got, after all, those who are eating and those who have money, one day everything will end. And when everything ends, they too they will die. One day everything will end. At that time, what will you have? What will be the joy of your life? That's why it says every man that has this hope in him, you wake up in the morning, you say, well, Lord, I'm going to work. But this work is not the most important thing in my life. I'm going to the market. This is not the most important thing in my life. I'm going to school. This is not the most important thing in my life. But the hope that I will see the Lord on the final day. Therefore, Lord, as I am laboring to have the things of the world, help me labor to have this holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I'm, I'm asking you, those of us in business, and you're spending so much time getting money, do you spend as much time seeking for salvation? And seeking for holiness, seeking for sanctification. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. I'm asking those of you that are still students. You go to school and you go to school from morning till evening. The time you spend looking for certificate, certificate that will be burnt up. It's good to go to school. It's good to look for certificate. Do you spend the same time looking for eternal life, asking for salvation? Asking for sanctification. Asking for this holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I want to build and I want to have this. The time you spend looking for money. Looking for I must build this. I must make this. I must make that. The time you spend looking for perishable things. The things that will not last. The things that will be burnt up. Do you spend the same time? 
the same amount of time preparing for heaven every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure and that, that's, that's what gets us prepared but if we're holding spiritual things with loose hands salvation with loose hands sanctification with loose hands and then the thing that will grab and the thing that will hold and the thing will not joke will not play with and i don't joke with my work and take church from me you can take salvation you can take spiritual i don't joke with my work there you are don't joke with it it will be taken away from you one day but if you can turn around and say i don't joke with salvation let them take what they want let them take whatever it is they are struggling for but this salvation this life eternal and this sanctification holiness without which no man shall see the lord i don't joke of that that's the right attitude you ought to have as we see the day of the lord approaching the preparation we make is that we become part of the glorious church without spot without wrinkle in ephesians chapter 5 ephesians chapter 5 reading from verse 25 husbands love your wife even as christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any sort of thing but that it should be holy and without blemish holy and without blemish that, that's what it will take in titus chapter 2 titus chapter 2 reading from verse 11 titus 2 11 is telling us here that the grace of god that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lost ungodliness will try to enter you deny it you resist it you reject it teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world why are we doing that why the righteousness why the sobriety why the godliness in this present world because we're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great god and our savior jesus christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works that's what it takes we need to prepare isaiah chapter 33 isaiah chapter 33 i'm reading to you from verse 15. isaiah 33 and in verse 15 here yeah, it tells us he that walketh righteously continuously walketh monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday saturday sunday monday again you start all over again walking consistently not that you not a spasmodic kind of thing you live righteously now it's interrupted again because of the flesh because of wrong motives because of impure intention then the holiness is interrupted then you wake up one day and live a righteous life then you you backslide again not that one he walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly consistently and that despises the gain of oppression that shaketh his hands from holding up prize that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood and shutteth his ears from seeing evil he shall dwell on high his, his place of defense shall be the munition of the rocks bread shall be given him his water shall not fail then i shall see the king in his beauty in his glory in his majesty and splendor and they shall behold the land that is very far off those are the people that are walking righteously and not brightly i'm sure you know psalm 15 but it's very important that you consider it and match it with your life and examine your life with these details we have in psalm 15 look at it in psalm 15 from verse 1 lord who shall abide in thy tabernacle who shall dwell in thy holy hill uh, the king uh, david uh, this david was a wise man wiser than his son solomon he had all the all the royalty everything surrounding royalty and yet he knew after all the throne and the hills and the city everything will be burnt in fire one day but when everything has melted away where will i be then there is the place of the lord a dwelling place of the lord lord who shall abide in thy tabernacle and who shall dwell in thy holy hill then he begins to now tell us one by one itemize them item by item and, and it's what you need to use now to examine your life and, and to look at your life and to ask yourself do you fit into the qualification of the people that will dwell with the lord on the final day he that walketh uprightly not crooked 
wickedly, walketh uprightly. He that walketh righteousness, not unrighteousness, unrighteous deals in business, unrighteous deals in marriage, unrighteous relationship men and women, unrighteous attitude, unrighteous action. He that walketh righteously and speaketh the truth in his heart. There are some people today, you cannot ask them simple question. They'll frame a lie. Because they're thinking about themselves. They're thinking about their prestige. They're thinking about their personality. They're thinking about the privilege they have in the church. They're thinking about the ideas other people have about them. And they cannot tell the straightforward, 100% truth. Those people, they, they are not conscious of heaven. They are not conscious of the coming of the Lord, that the Lord can come anytime. He that speaketh the truth in his heart. And I'm asking you, dear wife, do you speak the truth with your husband? Husband, do you speak the truth with your wife? Children, do you speak the truth with your parents? Employees, do you speak the truth with your employers? Because this is what it takes. He that speaketh the truth. In his heart. Not that he will hide the truth in the heart and he will bring out something that is different from the truth. He that backbites not with his tongue. And when you think about the church, 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 of, you know, people, and they can't talk about the Lord, they cannot witness, they cannot evangelize, all they are talking about, they are talking about so and so, they are talking about such and so, they are talking about who and who. But it says, the people that are preparing, preparing for the coming day of the Lord, they are the people, they don't backbite with their tongue. He does not do it evil to his neighbor. He will not do evil to his neighbor. He doesn't play with evil, joke with evil. He doesn't take delight in evil. He will not do evil to his neighbor. Not take up a reproach against his neighbor. In whose eyes a vile person is contempt. You know the people of the world, you know what they do? A, a vile person. A fraudulent person, a rogue, a thief, because he has money. Everybody, will, they, they, know, they know the work he does. They know he's a thief. They know he's a rogue. They know he's you know, a nice person. But everybody will be, you know, they'll be dancing around him because they want something. But they know in their heart he's a vile person, a backslider, because he has money. They won't tell him the truth. They won't tell him that the way you are going, should you die, where will you spend eternity? But... Those who are preparing for heaven, in whose eyes a vile person is contempt, but honoreth them that fear the Lord. The man may not have money, the woman may not have money, he may not have anything to give me, but it's a righteous man, it's a righteous woman. They honor the people that fear the Lord. He that swear to his own heart and changeth not. Swear to his own heart and changeth not. It's not the people that say, I thought I would serve the Lord before. I thought I would work for God before. I thought, you know, I would do this for the Lord before. And I even consecrated and made up my mind I would serve the Lord. But uh, the way things are going now, the circumstances and what I see, what I hear, I don't think I can do it again. Not those people. He that putteth not out his money to usury is not looking for lawful gain. Quick, quick money. Nor taketh of reward against the innocent. He that doeth such things, those things shall never be moved. In Psalm 24, I'm reading to you verses 3 and 4. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Here is David again asking. Interested. He wants to know because uh, the time you spend here on earth is just about 70 years or 80 years. But he wants to know, where am I going to spend eternity? Time without end. He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 14. Hebrews 12 from verse 14. Follow peace with all men. This is what it takes with your landlord. Follow peace with all men. With your tenants, follow peace with all men. With your teachers and principals, follow peace with all men. With your husband, your wife, follow peace with all men. With your children, your parents, follow peace with all men. With members of the church, follow peace with all men. With that troublesome neighbor in your community, follow peace with all men. The abuse you cannot abuse. The insult you cannot insult. And they try to wage war against you. You cannot wage war back. Because you have a goal. You have a place you are going. Because the day of the Lord is approaching. Follow peace with all men. And holiness. 
for those girls, holiness for those ladies, holiness for the wife of your friend, holiness for the ladies that you sit with in the bus, holiness and for the ladies in your office, holiness follow peace with all men and holiness holiness in the private and holiness in the public holiness in the church and holiness in the community holiness everywhere, holiness within your body and holiness in the works of your hand and the language of your mouth follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you <laughs> you know many things that happen there's some little little things you get angry bitterness rises up in you do you know that you are joking with heaven and you are gambling with your salvation because of this little thing, this little thing, this little irritation, wrath, anger, bitterness. What are you angry about? The things we're going to leave behind. The things that are going to be melted away in fervent heat. The things that somebody does to me now, somebody does to you now, in one month's time we cannot even remember the pain anymore. The thing is vanished away. That's what you're angry about. Be very careful lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Because it says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. That's why it's very important that uh, you are telling the Lord, Lord, I want to be ready. I don't want to uh, just be here. And then eventually uh, the time comes and the Lord comes and I'm not able to go. But you know that even though it may appear long and it appears we have been saying he will come, he will come, he has not come, but he's coming. I said it's coming. But at that time, you try to pray, it may be too late. This is the time to pray. Did you hear this before? I dreamed that the great judgment morning had dawned and a trumpet had blown. That was the time I dreamed that the nations had gathered to judgment before the white throne. From the throne came a bright shining angel and stood on land and the sea and his war with his hands raised to heaven. That the time has come now for judgment. Eternity is setting on men and time shall be no more. The rich man was there. All these things we are talking about, they, they, they will not care about the salvation. It's still about the riches, but his money had melted and vanished away because the day of the Lord had come and all those riches and all the money that he gathered in the banks, everything had melted away. A poor is chewed in the judgment and his debts were too heavy to pay. The great man was there, but his greatness when death came had been left far behind. The angel that opened the records, not a trace of his greatness could find. The gambler was there, and the drunkard, and the man that had sold them the drink, the people who gave him the license to you together and held it, did sing. I about the moral man, when he came to judgment, all his self-righteous rags they could not do. The men, after all, that crucified Jesus had passed off as moral men too. The soul that had put out salvation, not tonight. Look at the time. Look at the time. I'm in a hurry. I'm at my place so far. If I don't go in time, they will lock the gate to our house. I need to get to our our house in time you will get to your house but how about if you don't get to heaven which one is more important i'm going to my house i'm going to my i'm in a hurry not tonight i will pray another time not tonight they said i have no time now to get saved i'll get saved by and by no time now to think of religion at last they had found time to die and oh what a weeping and wailing as the lost were told of their faith they cried they cried they cried. No, I can't cry now. I'm a strong man. I'm a strong woman. I can't cry for anything. Wait. You will cry at that time. They cried for the mountains and the rocks. They prayed, but their prayer was too late. There's a time when prayer will be too late. Here is a time where you can pray, where you can call upon the Lord when the earth has melted and when all the sun has been darkened and the moon is turned to blood and the stars begin to fall and when everything on earth and the works that are therein shall be melted away 
were fervented, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Isn't this the time to call upon the Lord and to say, Lord, make me ready. Lord, make me ready. Lord, make me ready. I don't want to perish in sin. I don't want to perish with the people of the world. Lord, make me ready. Here is the time to pray. But if you pray too late, oh, what a weeping and wailing as the lost were told of their faith. They cried, they cried, they cried for the rocks and the mountains. They prayed, but their prayer was too late. Call upon the Lord before you go. Make sure you are saved. Make sure you are saved. If you are backsliding, make sure that you come back to the Lord. If you are backsliding, make sure you come back to the Lord. Because we don't know. We don't know what that day will be when the Lord will come. Get ready before he comes. <laughs>